Okay, and then uh, over to our amazing facilitator, John Axe. He will take it away. Okay, thank you, uh, Lance. And uh, welcome back to the second of the uh, six talks in the Winter ILR series given by Professor Gregory. I'm not going to repeat all of last week's introductory remarks for those of you who may not have been present last week to hear them. I'll just say that Fred is a much awarded Professor Emeritus of the History of Science and European History at the University of Florida. Fred has given many IOR lectures and we're always happy to have him back. Last week, Fred talked about the development of quantum and relativity theory that occurred early in the last century. But a few years earlier, in 1897, a French physicist named Henri Becquerel was investigating the theory that certain materials that naturally go in the dark did so by abs uh, absorbing sunlight. To test the theory, he placed a mineral sample on his windowsill for a period of time and measured the intensity of the light emission by placing it on a photographic plate in a dark room. But critically, uh, at the same time, he placed an identical sample that had not been exposed to light for several months. And what he found was that both samples emitted the same amount of light. So further investigation uh, showed that the light emitted was happened in the process of atoms spontaneously splitting apart. For this discovery, he shared the 1903 Nobel Prize in Physics with Pierre and Marie Curie, names that you are, you are all more familiar with. So having discovered that the nucleus of atoms can split apart naturally, physicists then set, up, set upon trying to understand how other atoms could be forced to split. So nuclear physics was born. And with that introduction, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Fred Gregory. Well, thank you, John. Uh, let me share my screen here and we'll get underway. And now I have to go. Hang on just a second. There we go. Everybody see that? All right. Um, well, yeah, this is our second lecture and I am going to be talking about Becquerel uh, and a little bit later. And I also want to give you uh, another warning about today's talk. It's got a lot of different things in it. But we're going to see, and I, I, I warn you not to try and worry about following every little bit of that, because it can get overwhelming in importance. Or I'm mean, sorry, it can, you can get lost in trying to remember all of the diverse things that I'll be talking about. We'll have a couple main points that we want to come to at the end. But we will be exploring a little bit more today about how quantum mechanics, in particular, was very relevant to the story of the nuclear age. We don't have a nucleus yet. We're gonna get one today. So today's talk is splitting the atom is impossible. Uh, I thought you'd like my little gif there. Now, last week, uh, there were a couple of things that we didn't talk about that were assumed. And uh, they have to do with some developments earlier in the century. Um, Hans Christian Ersted was talking in front of a class and he was demonstrating something he had been privately been able to do. He had always been convinced that the forces of nature are interrelated. Uh, he had this very romantic, it was a time of German romanticism and he had this conviction that all of nature is involved, is, you know, connected in a web-like way and that the forces of nature would, would share that. And so he kept trying to figure out what the relationship between electricity and magnetism was. I mean, we have electrical current as of the beginning of the century with Volta and his battery uh, and laws of electrostatics had been understood in the late 
18th century. So he was able to place a, a magnet near a current carrying wire, and he saw that the magnet was deflected, that compass was deflected. And uh, he had then effectively used electricity to produce a magnetic effect. So he's now convinced that he's right, that electricity and magnetism are related in some ways. And that set off a whole bunch of exploration about what that interrelationship might be like. And it was Michael Faraday, a very interesting character from the 19th century, who in the early 1830s uh, was able to show something that is not that hard to show, a magnet with iron filings. And it shows this kind of um, what you see up there in the, in the screen, the, what will eventually he will refer to as a field. Uh, and he su successfully therefore used a magnet to produce an electrical effect. So he's going in the opposite direction from Ersted, who was using electricity to produce a magnetic effect. And so he did in 1845, start talking about a magnetic field. And that term gained currency. And by 1864, James Maxwell conceived of an electromagnetic field to express the mutual influence on each other of electricity and magnetism. Now, Maxwell was a very interesting character. He was from Scotland. And he described this field mathematically in a set of equations, which you see there. And uh, I don't understand them other than to know they exist, but there are four of them. And they successfully capture the interaction of electricity and magnetism. Now he was a Scot and a very homespun. He was not a pretentious kind of guy, even though he was enormously gifted mathematically as well as in physics. Uh, these equations, revealed that electricity and magnetism propagated as waves. Uh, further, that the waves moved at a speed close to that to the speed of light. So what he was able to show then was that light was essentially an electromagnetic wave. And uh, if you ask the question, where did he come up with that? Things get even more mysterious or bizarre or wonderful, depending on your perspective, I suppose. Because way back at the beginning of the 19th century, Thomas Young, through an experiment shining light through two different splits, or uh, uh, slits, I'm sorry, argued that light can be thought of as waves. Now, that was a little bit of a change because Newton had talked about waves a bit, fits of uneasy reflection and refraction he talked about, but he mainly saw light as a particle. And up until Young, the, uh, the idea was probably more dominant that light would should be thought of as particles streaming from some source to the eye, right? But with this experiment, Young more or less established what we will call the wave theory of light. And if you have a wave, you have to ask what's waving. And they, they assumed it was something called the ether. Now, Newton also had an ether when he was trying to explain gravity. And, uh, and so, these waves in an ether, an ether is a very, very, it's a substance, but it's not like anything that we know as solid, liquid, and gas. And it's very flimsy, but it pervades all of space in all directions. And so that was the dominant conception as the 19th century went on, the wave theory. Now, here's what I mean by, by Maxwell's homespun conceptions of nature. He imagined that in this ether, which you can imagine is present on this blank screen because it's so flimsy, you can't really see it, but it's, it's there, all right? Uh, and he imagined there were twists in it as if you could take a, a, a section of this and then just twist it with your hand. There would be twists in that. And that he said was corresponding to the magnetic effects. But these twists, which existed all, all, out, all around, were, were able to move with respect to each other because they had little ball bearings uh, in between each other. Now, here's a picture of what we're talking about. You can see that those, let me see if I can use my cursor to here. To, here's one of the twists, and these are the ball bearings. And so these twists move with respect to each other. And uh, so you can see from this model that Maxwell had in his head that, that you can't do one without the other. If you move, if you twist that thing, you're going to move the, those little ball bearings. And, and, uh, that when they move, the other is affected. So that's interlocked in a way. And this shows how magnetic and electrical effects happen together. Now you say, where did he get that idea? I have no idea where he got this notion or how he came up with it. But what he does is he's able to describe the torque 
involved in these twists. And of course, he can describe the, uh, the translational motion that is happening by virtue of the ball bearings and the way they move. And, uh, and so he can do that mathematically. And it turns out that is an accurate uh, description of this wave that is generated. So that's what I meant, I think last week, I may have referred to the fact that the French didn't like the English way of going about things because they like to do it in an abstract, purely mathematical way. And they said, we thought we were entering an abode of reason with Maxwell and his ideas and we enter a factory instead. And so they, they thought this was uh, not an appropriate way to do physics, but it works. And so, <coughs> pardon me. Well, in the years after Maxwell, uh, lots of serious uh, the discoveries were made of new phenomena. And here's where I mean, we're, we're gonna describe several of them here, uh, particles and new forms of radiation. And, uh, and first of all, it's gonna be a new particle of electricity that comes to the, to the fore. And then we're gonna do X radiation. And we're also gonna do what John was talking about, radioactivity. So let's start. Well, electromagnetic radiation became a real focus of study. Even Faraday had done experiments by passing an electrical current through a partially evacuated tube. And these tubes became known as cathode ray tubes. And you can see that the current would go from the cathode here to the anode, negatively charged to the positively charged. And, and so these experiments, you ask me, why did they do them? Well, I often sometimes say it's, it's kids playing, you know, playing, trying to do things either blow them up or just doing anything. And that, that's part of what's going on here, that they're just saying, what would happen if? And so now when you get this, this current going through this evacuated tube, <clears throat> you notice some glows and various things that say, oh, we got to figure that out. What's that? What later physicists learned that these rays, which uh, you could deflect them, you could focus them, and you could even use them to turn a paddle wheel. So they conveyed energy. So you're, you're learning things about these rays, but you're not quite sure exactly what they are. But some said, well, if they can turn a paddle wheel, they must be made of something, uh, you know, that, that's like a particle. And in fact, it would be a negatively charged particle. You could show that by the way you deflect them and how you do it. So they're learning things. And by the end of the century, J.J. Thompson was able to calculate the charge to mass ratio of one of these alleged particles. And that kind of confirmed that it was, in fact, a particle. And he began to assume that these particles now were actually a constituent of all atoms. And it wasn't that long before they became known as electrons. And so the, now we have a new particle, a negatively charged particle. Uh, and so then the question is, well, all right, we have a particle in the and it's a constituent of an atom, and it's a negative charge. The atom has to be neutral in charge by itself. Uh, so uh, what, how does that work? So where is that positive charge? And Thomson came up with one of the first models of the atom and it became known as the plum pudding model because on the left here, you see some good old English plum pudding and you see the raisins in there. And this was his model, which resembled that plum pudding a bit because he has these negatively new particles of electrons and they constitute a certain total of electrical charge. So it has to be balanced by a positive charge. And that positive charge he imagined to be just distributed and diffused over the entire surface of the atom. So this is called the plum pudding model of the atom. And it was helpful. But there are other strange way, rays being detected here at the end of the 19th century toward the end. Because just before Thompson's calculation, Röntgen over in Germany noticed that when a cathode ray struck a metal in the tube, there was an unexpected result. In particular, there was a piece of cardboard in the vicinity of the cathode ray experiment. This kind of happens a lot. It happened in the end of the 18th century when somebody's doing an experiment over here in the lab and something happens over in another part of the lab and they can show that somehow the, these things are connected. Well, this cardboard was coated with a substance that could fluoresce. And so that obviously became relative or important. It was clearly not a cathode ray. Röntgen called them X-rays and they had an amazing penetrating capacity. He called them X-rays, of course, we don't know what they are, right? You know, they're the X. So he asked his wife to come into the lab and she held her hand on a plate and exposed it to these X-rays. They don't really know what they're dealing with. And so some of these early experiments 
seem to be a little dangerous from our point of view. Well, at least uh, this, this particular wouldn't have been bad, but you know, you're playing with something you don't really understand. And so this, this capacity of these new rays to be able to penetrate through a hand and expose the structure of the bones was an amazing property. And so you've got this now on your hands. Now, Becquerel over in France read Röntgen's paper and was curious about the mention here. Uh, and so he knew about fluorescence. And as John was just explaining, he would shine sunlight on a crystal compound of uranium, uranium he'd been working on. And he thought he had produced something, but he didn't know what it was. He wanted to know if he could produce these X-rays without involving cathode ray tubes. Uh, and so he was trying to do that. And sure enough, when he let the sunlight hit the crystals and wrapped them in black paper, what he thought were X-rays penetrated the paper and showed the outline of the crystal. So maybe I've got X-rays here. Um, well, the problem was uh, he was not able to continue his experience. This is the, the version I've heard, John, of why he didn't continue right away. And there was some, this, you know, you have to have sunlight, he thought. And so he had wrapped them in some paper because of the day was cloudy and he couldn't really do the experiment. And he left them in the drawer for a while. And then when he came back, uh, he developed the plates and saw that the, uh, they'd been, that the, the plates that, that had been far better exposed than the ones that he deliberately exposed to sunlight. And these compounds were containing uranium had this capacity and so it didn't matter whether they were fluorescent or not. Uh, they could not show the bone structure. So they clearly were not x-rays. They were something else. And he didn't know what they were. But then the Curies found other elements than just uranium that produced these new rays. And they coined the term radioactivity for this kind of phenomena that was going on. So as I indicated, we've got all this stuff happening. And there's a lot going on here. Now, over in England, Rutherford was doing um, experiments with radioactivity, and he learned that a particle that was, re that was radiated in certain cases had a, an atomic mass of four and a charge of plus two, but it was a particle. It was, well, we know it to be a helium nucleus, but they didn't know that at the time. They just knew that this particle that they had isolated, which was given off in some radioactive experiments, uh, made an ideal bullet to fire at molecules because it was heavier. You know, it was a big, bigger particle. And so this, this was an ideal. So you've got boys playing games again. And so he starts firing these things at all kinds of stuff. And in his lab, um, some of his students fired what he's now calling alpha particles at gold foil. And he expected to see them scattered through various angles uh, as they encounter the gold. But the emission of the alpha particles became known as alpha radiation. And that's the first of several different kinds of radiation that we will see accompanies radioactivity. So he did, or his students actually did this experiment. You see over here on the left, where did my cursor go? There it is. Um, this is the substance of the alpha radiation, fires it through onto the thin gold foil. And he sees that it's deflected in various ways. But he notices that, or his students notice and come bring it to him and say, hey, look at this. Some of it goes at this angle. That's a pretty big angle to be deflected through. Uh, so some of the alpha particles are sc scattered through an angle greater than 90 degrees. That surprised him because how could that be? I mean, you've got this positive charge on the gold atoms that's diffused over the surface of the, uh, of the atom, but you have this really highly concentrated alpha particle, which has a double plus uh, charge. So that didn't make any sense that the diffused charge on the gold atom would, would be able to repel that incoming alpha particle like that. So that wouldn't be possible unless Thompson's model was not right. It could make sense if the atom's charge wasn't really diffused over the surface like the plum pudding model, but if it was concentrated somehow, it might make sense. So let's redo this experiment. And now let's assume that the atom of gold foil here, the atom of gold, has a concentrated positive charge instead of a uh, diffused one over the entire surface of the atom. So now if you bring the um, alpha particle in, depends on the angle, it'll be repelled. 
but there are some cases where if it came in directly, it might be repelled back. So that made sense then. All right, we, we, can, we can understand what's going on now, but we have to change what the, the way we think of what the atom is like. It's not like plum pudding. It's this more like a, a, a planet and its satellites going around it. These would be the electrons going around it. So that was the, then known as the Rutherford model of the atom. And with it, you obviously have this concentrated positive charge at the center, which was the nucleus. And that is the dawn of the nuclear age, because we now have a nucleus right here, right? And these electrons are going around it in, in various orbits. But there was a problem. There's always a problem, right? <laughs> there is a problem. If you have an orbiting electron, that constitutes a changing electric field. But Maxwell had shown that if you have a changing electric field, that produces a changing magnetic field, which in turn would produce a changing electric field, and so on. In other words, you got an orbiting electron would produce a wave of electromagnetic radiation that goes, you know, electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, that kind of phenomena. And so, well, what's the problem with that? Well, if the electron is radiating, then it's going to be losing energy and it wouldn't be able to sustain the orbit around the nucleus. So what's going to happen is that that electron is eventually going to collapse into the nucleus as it, lose, as it loses energy. In other words, Rutherford's model of the atom is inherently unstable. Nice try, but no good. Well, you don't really want to give it up though. And there was a young Danish student who was using the last of his fellowship to work uh, under Rutherford there in Manchester, and he heard about this model and its problems. Now, he'd been talking to a colleague about spectral lines that were associated with elements, and <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> he learned about a mysterious formula. See how much this physics and history of science is filled with these mysterious things that happen and nobody really can understand them, but then they are opportunities for investigation. But at any rate, there was a, this guy named Balmer who had come up with a formula. Nobody knew where he'd gotten it from or why, but it gave the frequencies of the first of the four lines of hydrogen's emission spectrum. What's an emission spectrum? Well, that's hydrogens and it's, uh, it has frequency of light. So emission spectrum is the pattern of lines that's formed when light passes through a prism to separate it into the different frequency of light it contains. And they're unique for every element. So if you do this, you'll see there's a hydrogen emission spectrum and it has these four lines in it. Um, and so what this guy had realized is, well, the frequency of the red line is, you know, there it is right there, but it's got three other lines. If you just replace the frequencies of the second, of the, um, the, the fractions in this formula, uh, if you replace that with, three, four, or four, five, and six respectively, you get the frequencies of the other uh, lines in the hydrogen spectrum. So where did he get that? Nobody else knows that. It's called Balmer's Babylonian mathematics because the Babylonians used to have mathematical procedures that ended up, they, they weren't interested in showing their work, so to speak. So they just write it down and say, well, this, 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 and this. And somebody say, well, how, where did you get that? They didn't say. And so that's, that's what's happening here. You've got this formula. Nobody knows where it came from or how he got it. I guess there's probably a story. I don't know it, though. And anyway, nobody knew why this worked, only that it did. So Bohr was very clever. This was the Danish student, Niels Bohr. And he realized that that formula, you could write that formula in a different way. And if you did it that way, it involved Planck's constant H. Hmm. Well, that would mean we've got some kind of, of quantized energy involved with this. So Planck's idea of quantizing energy is somehow involved in determining the frequencies permitted to the hydrogen spectral lines. And that meant that the electron could only orbit the nucleus at certain energy levels. So in other words, here's Rutherford's model, right? And you've got the nucleus and you've got the electrons orbiting, but they, they're not just free to orbit anywhere. They have to orbit at specified uh, levels here because the energy is quantized. So they can go here and here or down here, but they can't be in between, according to this. That's that curious result of that. 
Now, when an electron radiates energy, it drops from a higher energy level to a lower one. And when it absorbs, it goes from a lower one up to a higher one. That was the way Bohr interpreted this. Because he had gone earlier, um, well, the student had gone earlier to Rutherford and said, look at this, this is this, uh, no, I guess Bohr had gone to him and said, this is what's happening. But then Rutherford had said, well, how does it know where to go? You know, you're going from here and only going to that one. That's the only permit. And it involved Planck. That was the answer. So this answered a question Rutherford had asked, how does the electron know where to go? Of course, again, there's problems, right? And some bizarre consequences. For one, the electron could never be between energy levels. That didn't make a lot of sense, except it was consistent with the idea that energy is quantized. It's not nice and smooth and consistent. It's quantized, it comes in discrete amounts. For another, the idea that an orbiting electron radiated energy, that's something that had been an axiom since classical mechanics, that had to be given up. It just couldn't be the case because it's clear that if you have an electron that's orbiting, it's radiating energy. And so uh, you had to give that up if you couldn't go just anywhere. Uh, and so that was a consequence of this. Well, that meant there's some big challenges ahead. Hydrogen was the simplest atom, right? And we have the hydrogen emission spectrum, but that's only got one proton. We don't, we'll call it one proton. They did. Yeah, I guess they did. Uh, Rutherford had named it. And so there was no, you know, that's nice. It's like, uh, you know, when uh, somebody, uh, so I think when somebody bought, um, oh, I've forgotten the guy's name for a minute. The guy who came up with uh, the uh, laws of heredity, Mendel. When Mendel's laws had been, you know, the one, two, one, and the one, three, three, one, those laws of how things get, hereditary characters get passed on. Uh, he, he had done that with peas and some other things. And so he took this result and was trying to share it with some other people. And they said, that's very nice. It's very interesting, but it's way too simple. It can't be that, that you know, here, try this one. And they gave him some hawkweed and it tried it on that and it didn't work at all. In other words, this, this is hydrogen, maybe true for hydrogen, but we've got atoms with a whole lot more protons uh, than, than hydrogen. And so how are you gonna deal with those? Um, and so that was gonna be the challenge. So if you're gonna do anything involving Planck and this new quantized energy business, you're gonna have a real challenge in your hand. Now Bohr came up with a, oh, uh, it was just a patchwork system. He would take some classical ideas that didn't resort to Planck's quantizing energy and combine them with Planck's equation. And he was able to come up with a system that was very clumsy and he didn't even like it, but it did get the job done of trying to help out explaining what the higher, uh, what the, the more complex atoms would be like and explaining them, right? But it was a hybrid system. He didn't like it. Nobody else liked it. It was unclear why it worked at all. And so, the problem was we don't really want to get rid of Rutherford's model of the atom because it's very obvious that it solves that scattering question. So we're in a bind here. We don't know what we're doing. Now Bohr began to rethink the nature of electromagnetic radiation of light. And uh, when Einstein had explained the photoelectric effect we talked about a bit last week, the quanta were behaving like bullets that knocked out electrons to produce a current. And I think I said at the time, if that had been the only thing that had come along that uh, used the notion of quantized energy, I doubt that the idea of quantum mechanics would have ever come to the fore. But here, Bohr is about to uncover something new. It was as if light, which had been thought of as a wave, was behaving like a particle. Okay. Well, then in 1924, De Broglie, and I don't think that's the French pronunciation, but I don't know how to do it if it's real French. So those of you who can do it, uh, my hat's off to you, propose that the electron itself, you could think of the electron itself as a wave. He even gave a formula for its wavelength. And guess what? What do you think emerges somehow? Planck's constant is involved in this thing. Whoa, interesting. That really didn't surprise people because they kind of felt that Planck was going to be around for a while. So what this formula required is that the wave must have an integral number of wavelengths around the orbit. Couldn't be just any number, 
it had to be an integral number. You can't have one and a half. What does that sound like? It sounds like Planck's quantized energy to me. It sounds like this requirement that you have to only have an integral number of wavelengths is consistent with the Planck notion of quantized energy. And in fact, uh, others soon showed that electrons could be diffracted. That means, yes, they are waves after all. So we're really going strong here. Bohr preferred to think of the electron as a particle because that's the way he had uh, dealt with it. And in that same year, he figured out a way to represent mathematically what was happening inside the atoms that were the, you know, the ones with more complicated nuclei in our terms here. Um, and, uh, and so when they changed orbits and all of that, it was equivalent. It was very complex because you don't have just hydrogen with one proton at its, in its nucleus. You have atoms with many. So how do you deal with that? Well, there were cases in which you'd have to multiply a whole series of things by another whole series of things. And he figured out the way to do this when he was on a vacation up in northern Germany and uh, near the water up there. And he was sitting on a rock and he was figuring out how this would have to be. And he went and did it and he showed it to somebody and they said, oh, gee, that reminds me of uh, mathematics that I had back as a student in the late 19th century. And they figured, they went back and found that that was matrix mechanics. And he now was able to use that kind of mathematics, assuming that the electron is a particle, to describe the more complex atoms and their behavior. Uh, so it now had a quantum mechanical explanation of the atoms. So this is really the birth of quantum mechanics. Last week, we only talked about the notion of quantum theory, you know, that how does quantum mechanics actually differ from classical mechanics? Well, in classical mechanics, energy is radiated and absorbed in a continuous fashion. In quantum mechanics, energy is radiated and absorbed in packets, in little bullets. So we have the birth of quantum mechanics here. Bohr's matrix mechanics assumed the electron was a particle, but in two more years later, an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrödinger gave a mathematical description of the electron's behavior inside the, assuming that it was a wave. And that's the famous formula <coughs> you sometimes see on t-shirts that kids have, Schrodinger's wave equations. Well, this was soon shown to be equivalent to Bohr's and it was easier to use. Uh, physicists were familiar with wave equations. They've been dealing with them for a long time. <clears throat> so everybody preferred this way of expressing it, even though it was equivalent to Bohr's. It didn't even have these quantum jumps between orbits to explain the quantum nature of radiation in atomic spectra. So <clears throat> there were some definite advantages and this is the one that has survived. However, what we got then is a um, physicist is saying that the electron is both a wave and a particle. And that's a dilemma that's been with us ever since. Uh, <clears throat> well, we're making great st strides here in the studies of the electron, but let's turn our attention now to the nucleus, which we have uh, realize has a lot of interesting properties. They continued bombarding various nuclei of elements, just the way Rutherford's students had done with the gold. And they noticed that often in these experiments that there would be a hydrogen nucleus, uh, that is a particle which had a single positive charge, uh, one proton essentially, would be ejected. And that particle was then dubbed the proton. I guess this is when it gets named, when in the aftermath of the gold scattering, uh, they, they continued doing it and Rutherford came up with this idea of a proton. So it was natural to assume that in more complex atoms, uh, <clears throat> hydrogen would gain their complexity by having more protons in the nucleus to balance the greater number of electrons. So you, helium, you have two electrons, you must have two protons, right? And so helium, that, that would be what you'd assume. But there was a little bit of a problem. There's always a problem. And that is that the helium nuclei, nucleus must have two protons, but the mass, the atomic mass of the helium nucleus was four times the mass of hydrogen nucleus, not two. So where'd this extra mass come from? Well, that was a question. And barium was even worse. It had 56 electrons, but its nucleus had a mass not 56 times, but 137 times that of hydrogen. So it had a lot more mass. 
And so it was in 1932 when Rutherford's assistant Chadwick showed that experimenters over in France had erred in their explanation of the ejection of protons. They were bombarding uh, paraffin wax with gamma radiation. Gamma radiation was another kind of radioactive uh, activity. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he declared, that is Chadwick did, that there must be a nuclear, neutral particle in the nucleus to, to account for the extra weight, right? And Rutherford had actually suggested something like that much earlier, but Chadwick had done uh, the experiment and had figured that out in a way that was very convincing. And thus they dubbed the neutron. So here is the proton, here's the nucleus now. It has all these protons to balance the charge of the electrons, but then it has these neutrally par charged particles and they don't have any charge, but, and there may be even more of them than there are protons in a given nucleus. And that then is the constitution of the nucleus now. So we're making major pro uh, progress. Well, a new question emerges. How in the world <clears throat> could these protons be packed together in such close quarters? Why? Well, because protons are positively charged. And we know positive charges repel each other. So how in the world are you going to pack 56 covariance <laughs> tables? How are you going to pack that many or protons into a nucleus? That's going to really be an amazing thing. There must be some kind of an extremely powerful force that's going to keep them from flying apart. <clears throat> and in fact, there is. It's called the strong nuclear force now. If scientists could get at that force, it would be a tremendous new source of energy. <clears throat> but how you, you can't, you know, what they had up to that point <clears throat> was just chipping away at the nucleus through radioactivity. Now you would, you would get some radioactivity and it would change the atomic uh, mass numbers and, and uh, charge numbers, uh, but by a little bit at a time, that was all they could do. Nobody could think of any kind of way of getting at the strong bond between those protons that must exist there. <clears throat> So here's what Rudd Rutherford said in 1933 to the New York Times. Anyone who says that with the means that we have at present at our disposal and with our present knowledge, we can utilize atomic energy. If you think that's what we can do, you're talking nonsense. You're talking moonshine, he said. So in other words, splitting the atom is in fact impossible. So we'll stop there and I will stop sharing here. And we're back. So um, that's what we're talking about today. We're bringing it up to the eve of learning how, in fact, to do that. <clears throat> but at the beginning, the prospect did not seem very likely. <clears throat> so I'll take some questions. And you can send them in the chat, or you can use the raise hand function, or you can raise your hand on screen, and I will be looking out for anyone and calling on you, and then you can unmute. That was a lot of info there, I realized, so. Um, uh, I see uh, Bob Vernstein, you have a question? Um, uh, Bob, you're unmuted. You're muted right now. Here, let me ask to unmute. Still can't hear you. Uh, yeah, you're, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you, Bob. Are your headphones connected? Is that better? We can hear you now. Does that work now? Yep, yep, yeah. yeah. Still can't hear me? No, yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you good. Uh, he can't hear you. Yeah, I think that's it. Now he's muted. No. Well, in the meantime, some, someone else then. Okay. In the meantime, while you work on that, we'll we'll jump. Uh, uh, I I see a question from Ron. Um, I just had a question. Um, in in describing. 
it, uh, headphones, uh, but you can't hear me. Is that correct? Yeah. No, we can hear you. I was wondering who puts together the quant the quantum nature of waves and the quantum nature of particles. I mean, we could split the atom, but you get quarks and bosons and weird part little particles that are basic particles that we you can't split. Who puts those two ideas together, and how does that come about? Well, that comes about in the twenties. I'll plug in to, for an answer. Okay. That comes about in the 20s, and it's involved in the major characters that I've been talking about, Schrodinger and Heisenberg, have these two different conceptual or mathematical models of the electron as a particle and the electron as a wave. And by putting those together in a series of mathematics, the, the Schrodinger form of that is, is the one that's preferred, as I've indicated, means that at the mathematical level, you can understand it. But at the intuitive level, you can't. In other words, in one case, it's a particle, and in another, it's a wave. This leads to what's called the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is to say that the wave and particle nature of the electron results depending on how you inquire of nature. In other words, the nature of the experiment you do. Nature will show itself as a wave and sometimes as a particle. And you put it together mathematically in either Schrodinger or Heisenberg's mathematical formulation of how the behavior goes. Now, both of those mathematical formulations are fine, except Schrodinger's is far easier to use than that clumsy one of matrix mechanics. And so that's the one that's been used. But I think in general answer to your question is, they put them together, but they don't put them together. In other words, they say, look, we have them together in the mathematics. We don't have them together in the intuitive explanation of what we're dealing with. And so that's been the consistent understanding. Now, Einstein never really bought into that and some other people don't either. They say, we'll figure it out eventually how this can be consistent. But that's part of what Bohr eventually meant when he said to Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Einstein would believe that this has to be, these inconsistencies have to be worked out. And Bohr is essentially saying, uh, it's beyond us right now and maybe will be forever. We have to learn to live with paradox and we have to have a little humility. Uh, and that, that, to my knowledge, has not been bettered. Nobody has gotten rid of these paradoxes from quantum mechanics. But there's not really a paradox if you just stay in the mathematics of it. You, you're able to control things perfectly well if you just keep on the mathematics. But once you step outside the mathematics, you've got problems. I hope, Thank that, you. I hope that helps, yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're going to jump back over to Ron real quick, unless that helped answer your question. Uh, no, I, I, the, my question is perhaps a little more simple. Um, in describing what the students did in the labs and that sort of thing, um, you described how they found that when the, when the rays were passed into a nucleus, uh, a little electron would shoot out or, you know, things like that. How did they measure those things, Fred? Well, those are blips on a screen. So they have these, uh, they, they have to figure out ways. And you saw that when they were, they have a, a substance that's radioactive and mm -hmm. they are able to direct some of that radioactivity, which goes all over the place through a slit, which isolates it and then directs it in the direction of a screen with, but you've got a, an atom in front of it. That is, you've got gold foil or you've got some other kind of foil. Mm -hmm. and, and then they have watched what happens on a screen and they see blips coming here, but they have screens all the way around and they could see that it was deflected here, 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 and here. And also somebody on the screen behind us here. And that, that's what really uh, amazing, you know, so how can this be? You can yeah. imagine the student's excitement of running to rather and say, <laughs> hey, look at this. <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, it, it really what it says is before the theorists could begin to tackle these things, they needed to have some demonstration like that that was yeah. actually going on. Oh yeah, sure, sure. And and it's another way of putting this, Ron, is you have to have problems that occur in order to get farther along, right? Mm -hmm. And as I've been saying, there's always a problem, but that's what makes science so exciting. And I get really angry at people who get mad at science for being wrong. I mean, I, I just can't 
That's just not the way science behaves. Science, in one sense, is glad to be wrong occasionally because it's an opportunity to learn something new. And sure. they never, well, if they do claim that this is the way it is, I think they're presumptuous. But basically, it's the idea of this is the best we got right now. And, you know, let's, let's see what we can uncover. And it's usually developing some kind of major problem that is the opportunity to move ahead. And sometimes in hugely different ways, sometimes in a total new paradigm. And, and usually those problems show up in a lab someplace, right? Yeah, Where they do. They, they often do. They often do, happens. or at least, in, at least in some kind of empirical way that right. you're, you're looking at or you're measuring or someplace like that. That's what they, and, and Kuhn's explanation, I refer to Kuhn's structure of scientific revolutions, which I've talked about at ILR before, but I don't think you necessarily have to remember that, <laughs> if, even if you did hear it. But Kuhn says we have a background of, of success. We have a background of expectation. So we go into something and we expect certain things. <laughs> and he thinks that there's a difference between people who can spot against that background something that's anomalous. Mm -hmm. He uses the example of, a, of a, card, a deck of cards, but in that deck of cards, you have a red ace of spades, all right? So he says, if I flash those cards past you, you'll never even see that red ace of spades. Why? Because you don't expect it to be there, yeah. right? But there are some people who would say, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. I don't know what it is. There's something wrong with it. And if you slow it down a little bit, they'll come, hey, there's a red ace of spades in there. <laughs> you know, that's what we're talking about here. The people who either set up an experiment or notice something, or it's just not the way you think it's supposed to be. It's nature telling you, not so fast, Schultze. I remember that joke about that Schultze had been in the, in the military and somebody said, unfortunately, Schultze had a message that, that neither of his parents, that both of his parents had died. And the sergeant that was told, you have to tell Schultz about this. So he lined up the whole squad and he said, all right, all those of you who have parents that are alive, take one step forward. Not so fast, Schultze. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next up, we have a question in the chat from Rick Gold. Uh, and they say, how did they calculate the mass of the nucleus? Well, that's a good one. Um, I don't know the answer to that. We got John, where's John? When you need him. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer, so I, I shouldn't even try to, to comment on that. Um, but I bet if you see John somewhere or if he's- He's muted. John, yeah, if you, if you could unmute yourself, we can see you, but we can't hear you right now. I'm pressing, I'm pressing unmute, but- Yeah, we got you, you now we can hear you. <laughs> Whoops, now you're muted again. You muted yourself again. Still, still muted. One hold, more click there. Hold your space bar down, John. Yeah, that's good. Still cannot. John, you're still muted. John, there we, no. now, now you are. Yeah. You're okay, good. all right, good. Okay, uh, let's see. The, so, the, so the question is, how do you how do you calculate the mass of a nucleus? You don't calculate the mass of a nucleus. You measure the mass of a nucleus, and the way you do that is to um, make uh, turn the, the the neutral atom into a into an ion which is electrically charged by knocking off uh, an electron or one or more electrons. And then you can uh, use a magnetic field to deflect that uh, charged atomic uh, nucleus. And the, the, amount of, the, the amount of deflection uh, caused by the magnetic field will allow you to measure the uh, mass of the of, of the nucleus. Uh, there's something called a mass spectro spectrogram, mm. spectrograph, which is which is the, the the modern way to to measure the the, the mass of of electrons. But uh, the the job of calculating 
why the mass is what you measure is another problem and is a much more complicated problem. But you, but you can very accurately measure the mass of a nucleus. Thank you. That helps. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, I see that uh, I, Eli Glazer, uh, you have your hand raised. Yes. Um, so first, uh, the, the concept of the atom was discovered or understood. Then we discovered that there were is an electron. Then we discovered the concept of a nucleus. But today we have the concept of a standard model. How did, what are the steps that occurred between the, the electron and the nucleus with a proton and a neutron to what we have today? How, what were the major steps that occurred? Oh, I'm gonna to have to turn that one over to John too, but we're talking about quarks and other kinds of things there. I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question, Eli? Uh, how did we get to the standard model? And when did the key steps happen that, that forced us to understand what the, what the elements of a standard model were? Yeah, what, what, yeah well, that's a, that is a more difficult uh, question to, to, to answer. But, but, but uh, I guess the, the simplest way to answer that is, is to say that a bunch of theorists playing around with various models found a model which was so compelling that they thought it must be right. <laughs> and, uh, and so then it, that model was tested. Just as the, the, it's not so different than what Bohr did. Bohr was just played around with, with some ideas that uh, could be tested. And when they're tested, they turn out to be right. What was the period of time when these things, when these uh, discoveries or these thoughts were evolved into this thing? Was it the last 20 years, the 30 years, 40 years? The, well, years? The, the standard model is uh, 40 years old, I'm kind of guessing. Our lifetime. Huh? Oh, yes, our lifetime. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely in our lifetime. And it's still being, re and the standard model is still being re uh, uh, revised a little bit as they learn more. Yeah, and I suppose we could add that <clears throat> what we've learned is that you probably ought not to assume that anything they come up with is the last word. <laughs> no, they just do an experiment that uh, further prove that some of Einstein's predictions were correct. And I think this was just done in the last year. Yeah, well, there's, I'm not sure, Ken, which one you're referring to, but I know that the idea that Einstein added to his general theory, this cosmological constant that would allow the universe to expand, whereas it hadn't, he had put it in there in order to keep the universe stable because that's what he thought the universe was. And then he called that the greatest mistake, greatest blunder of his life. And now people are saying, well, you know, with dark matter, uh, maybe, maybe we need that thing back in there. <laughs> and so um, if that's what you're referring to, that, that could be it, that he's right after all. There has, there's a way of somebody- It was that thinking. kind of measurement. Yeah. Somebody yeah. did. It was, huh, said, oh yes, this is exactly yeah. what Einstein would have uh, predicted. Yeah, well, that's again like Darwin because people say, well, Darwin has these major problems. But then in the 30s of last century, uh, people said, well, wait a minute now. Maybe we do need to keep Darwin just as he was. <laughs> He's doing fine with his natural selection. Um, next up, we have a, another question from the chat. This is from uh, Paula Crowley. And they ask, why did we use hydrogen for the bomb since that has the smallest number of protons available to release energy from? By the next way, lecture. physics was never my strong suit. <laughs> uh, next lecture, next lecture. <laughs> now, what, what we'll get first though, it might be a good point at which to make a major distinction. And that is um, when we start splitting the atom, we're gonna be talking about fission, right? That's splitting into two. Uh, and uh, I think that was borrowed from biology. That term was borrowed from biology to describe splitting the atom because we know that can happen. That's gonna give us the atomic bomb. And that's dealing with elements on the real heavy end of the periodic table, uranium and that kind of plutonium way up there, heavy, heavy, heavy. Hydrogen is the lightest one. That's not the atomic bomb. That's not the one that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The hydrogen bomb is due to a process called fusion. 
And that's when you take two hydrogen nuclei and ram them together and fuse them into a helium nucleus. And that process takes a great amount of energy to do, but in the process of doing it, you release an incredible amount of energy too. And in fact, that's why we call, it takes a lot of heat to put those things together, to force those hydrogen nuclei together in order to get helium. Uh, and that, that releases an enormous amount of energy. And that's what's called the hydrogen bomb or because of the heats involved, the thermonuclear bomb, right? So you first have an atomic bomb, then you have a hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb. And so uh, that's what we're gonna be talking about next time because the hydro, the hydrogen bomb is about a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb. So okay. we're talking Thank about big time you. problems. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, this is uh, Richard Petway, you have your hand up. I just have a comment, not a question. Uh, um, the matrix, use of a matrix that appeared in the discussion um, as a mathematical tool has really developed uh, beyond this. In other words, the interaction of mathematics and physics um, is well known, but I, as a statistician, that matrix kind of uh, invention has really uh, flourished widely because it deals with uh, the choices uh, in an economic framework that have multiple alternatives. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the um, planned economy of China uh, uses uh, quite a bit of matrix algebra uh, and matrix manipulation in its policy statements. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it's just a comment that the interaction of mathematics and physics and all science um, is a useful tool and it can be a useful tool in its own right mm. on the mathematical side. Um, and I just wanted to comment uh, on that and it's not required. Uh, it wasn't a question, it was just a comment. Well, thank, so, thank you for that observation because uh, the, the matrix uh, expression is, is a perfect example of when you've got Multiple causal, multiple possible causal factors, and you multiple outcomes, and right. you've got multiples on both sides of it, of the causality. That that the matrix mathematical expression can capture those things, uh, like you're saying. So whenever you have this this dilemma, uh, yeah, trying to deal with multiple this and multiple that, the unfortunate situation is the solution. Um, um, becomes uh, extremely difficult as the number of uh, uh, variables in the, in the matrix expand. And in fact, we only use, uh, uh, there's whole kind of uh, ways to manipulate the matrix uh, by going through the feasible region uh, of the solution. But it's, it's kind of like if you have airplanes and crews and locations to land, uh, the combination of that matrix, they just turn on the machine and let it run for several hours or days to solve that complex. And the, the solution beyond a two by two or three by three matrix uh, becomes very uh, protracted. Yeah, sure, that's right. Anybody else? Uh, there's one last question, it looks like, or um, uh, and it's from uh, Henry Logan. So yeah. feel free. Thank you. Fred, I have a question. One of the things that I've noted through your lectures and as I've read this very complex area is that many times the insights that allowed the next big leap came from another field, another set of studies, and I wondered as a historian, if someone has perhaps plotted the way these insights came in, because certainly communications was different in the late 1800s mm. than it was in the early 1900s. And now we're in 2021 
and it's vastly different. Mm -hmm. Has there been some careful uh, consideration as to how those insights arose and what this mass communication of today has done to further move science along? I'm not aware of any, I'm sure there are, but I'm not aware of what they are. Um, but it's true, uh, as we've noted in our subject, how often that happens. And there's lots of examples of that in other ways of how something in biology and physics gets together. And, and of course, we've all been aware, probably well, when we were younger, when we were going through college, the, the emphasis on interdisciplinary wasn't anywhere near as strong as it has been since we've gotten older. I mean, today, everybody recognizes the value of interdisciplinary. Uh, sometimes it's hard to do because of institutional things, but, but people know kind of instinctively, yeah, it's good to be open-minded and to you know, watch for things from any quarter. Now, the question is how, how often do we do these different quarters intersect? How often does that happen? And again, when it does, you have to have people who are sensitive enough or open enough to be able to recognize something somewhere else that's going to be actually, that's an interesting idea. I'd like to kind of pursue that. And I was suggesting at the end of last lecture that the intersection of these different quarters is not just from one science discipline to another science discipline. It's from anything to anything. I mean, lots of artistic and scientific things can be very suggestive to each other. Uh, certainly we've seen that in the direction from science to art, lots of art these days draws on images from science or you know, complexities or whatever. And it certainly goes the other way too, how the artistic creative impulse gets expressed in uh, different scientific labs. But whether somebody has studied that, as I say, I can't imagine that they haven't. I'm not aware of it, but it's a great idea. So I think that would be a good thing for somebody to do, who would have to be interdisciplinary him or herself to do it. You'd have to be kind of open to that idea. So yeah, I think it would be, it would totally enrich. That's part of what's going on by the recognition that we need more women in science for example, or we need diversity in science of all kinds, you know, ethnic diversity. The more diversity you've got, Darwin teaches us that, that's what, that's what you've got. When you've got sexual reproduction, you've got a whole lot more diversity. And so you're gonna be able to get a whole lot more out of it. And I think that's true here too. The more different things we bring, we don't wanna be in a process of weeding out. That's an old fashioned term. We wanna weed out the people who can't hack it, right? Well, I don't think that's the right way to go about it. You wanna, you wanna open it up and, and uh, be patient with those people who aren't performing necessarily according to your standards. If you can recognize in that person some kind of intense interest or innate intelligence, you know, let's wait and see a little bit what they can come up with, give them a chance to, to express what they're trying to say. So I heartedly endorse that kind of a study I'm not aware of it, but uh, of any that have been made, but I'm sure there probably are. I can't imagine there wouldn't be. Well, it seems that it is one of the bigger questions would be, what is the larger societal discourse that promoted the more silo approach, which perhaps moved it to a broader one? Certainly the ability to move by more rapid transportation. There were ships and then there were trains and yeah. so on and so forth. And then there were scientific meetings that you flew in jets. But um, anyhow, well, I'm going to see what I can find about that. Oh, that'd be good. That'd be great. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's also an inherent protection of one's own turf that causes a problem. Um, and you can understand that, that that happens, that you're not doing it the right way. You know, when quantum theory came along, all the older generation were saying, you guys are ruining science, you know, because there were all these paradoxes and all this kind of stuff. They said, we can't fund that kind of stuff. So yeah, you have that kind of uh, entrenched view that's awfully hard to overcome. That's an old, old story. That's just not confined to this context, but that happens all the time. Well, I thank you very much for your attention. You're amazing. Uh, we will get, next, next time we're going to have this thermonuclear bomb, and then we're probably, well, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the Manhattan Project, because I'm assuming a lot of people know about that, and focus more on the development of the hydrogen bomb. But then after we get that, 
then we're going to go into the cultural implications uh, in literature and things like that. So it'll change the tone of things. And I appreciate your willingness to wade through this preliminary stuff that I think is necessary to understand it, but uh, we'll, we'll get to different kinds of things down the road. Thank so, you very much, Fred. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks very much, Fred. Okay.